Welcome to this Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo. Welcome to today's Ruminant Podcast. I am Dr. Brian Sloan from Adiseo. Today I have the pleasure of um, having a conversation with Dr. Johanna Zorio, now with uh, Virginia, Virginia Tech. Today we'll be discussing um, the role of methionine, particularly in the transition cow period. Um, Johan, first, just welcome. And um, how's things going with your recent move to uh, Virginia? Hi, Brian. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's quite a quite a um, different change <laughs> of the scenario. A little warm here in Virginia uh, for the winter, but um, it, it's pretty bit. It's been kind of smooth uh, transition so far. So we're glad to be here. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't seem that long ago that uh, when we first met, I think when you were carrying out your first trials uh, with Adiseo back in uh, Illinois, probably back in sometime around 2010. But uh, what we'll talk about today was basically um, you started this and uh, there's been a lot of work in this area now. And we look forward to you sharing with us today, particularly the role of methionine in uh, transition cow health. Perhaps you'd like to set the scene first in terms of the challenges, the transition cow period poses for the dairy cow. Right. So um, for me, I think that is a the transition cow is a physiological puzzle with dire consequence for the dairy industry and dairy farmers. You know, as cows go into lactation, any um, uh, complications that they may have in the first 30 days can affect the whole lactation for the cow. And even for um, heifers can also be a problem uh, for involuntary calling of cows and overall being an economic problem for the dairy farmers. So um, some of those issues around the transition period is because there is a lot of uh, um, alterations in hormones and also uh, in metabolism. And more recently, uh, there is, has been a lot of work on the inflammation side. Um, so you may have two aspects that are combined within the same model in terms of metabolism and inflammation that can, you know, mediate what is the final uh, immunological status of the cow. Um, during this time, I think that one of the main um, hallmarks of what the cow is going through is the mobilization of fat, lipid metabolism. There is a lot of um, <clears throat> research in this area. And a lot of it is how the cow deals with all these fatty acids or fats that are being poured into the blood and then go into the liver. And while the cow is trying to make milk as well, um, there is a decreasing intake. There is a very important aspect of transition dairy cows, um, cows that don't eat, would be more challenged to uh, regain their positive energy balance. Perhaps you can um, you know, go a little bit more into detail on particularly that mobilization and the uh, um, and how the liver plays a really a key role or is a crossroads of really deciding or not whether if the cow may actually uh, have metabolic challenges. Yeah, so the... the um, one of the organs, I mean, the, the, the liver is one of the things that we have been looking at for quite a few years now, um, because all this fat is going to go and uh, concentrate to some extent in the liver. And then the liver has to deal with this uh, surge of fatty acids. So one of the things that have been observed is that the liver will tend to um, um, put all these fatty acids into triglycerides back to sterify them and pack it off in triglycerides and put them aside and try to keep going with all the other things that the liver has to do, uh, gluconeogenesis, uh, provide glutathione or antioxidants, and also um, deliver some of the vitamins that are essential for the animal during this time. So uh, while, the cat, while the liver is doing that, it has all their roles to play at the physiological level. So um, that's one of the things where um, um, nutrients 
like uh, amino acids can play a big role in the final um, performance, so to speak, of the liver in a transition dairy cow. Well, obviously, now you have you know had done many trials in this area, but I still think your your first trial was you know really set up the um, the hypothesis uh, eventually for you know how important is just one of these amino acids, methionine, in alleviating or or predisposing a better health uh, scenario for the dairy cow. Maybe you can you know, go through the various roles that methionine plays because there's not just one, there's, there's many roles methionine is playing at this level. Right. I'll go on to the slides because I've been <laughs> not using those slides. Um, so for to talk about uh, methionine, um, I think that is important to set up this scenario that I was just talking about. I think that this slide uh, give a good example of what was going on with the fatty acids going into the liver, and then the fatty acid will have a clear fate to be sterified back into triglycerides, but also can be oxidized in the mitochondria or partially oxidized and produce ketone bodies. And in this context, or what the essentially what the what the liver is going to do with those fatty acids, uh, an important aspect is that methionine can help to remove as many of those fatty acids uh, through various ways. One of them is to produce uh, all the synthesis or assembly of VLDL. So these are a type of lip lipoprotein in the body that is in charge to remove or translocate triglycerides from the liver into the bloodstream that can go into the mammary gland for milk fat um, synthesis. So in, 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 those, in this scenario, methionine can be utilized for producing phospholipids. There is a component of this VLDL and also for the production of apolipoproteins. There is another component of this VLDL or this lipoprotein. So you can see that this can, is, uh, has been a, a route for reduce the accumulation of fatty acids in the liver. Um, at the same time, there are some other um, uh, functions that methionine can be helpful. For instance, production of antioxidants that we have been working, um, and we're gonna work more on this area in the next few years. And also in the whole uh, synthesis of, of uh, um, uh, proteins. So there are some types of proteins that are not um, uh, are slightly different in the sense that they will react to an inflammation. So once there is an inflammation, some of those proteins will tend to increase and other ones to decrease as a response to that inflammation. So those are called acute phase proteins. So negative and positive, depending on what they're our responses to an inflammation. Is albumin one of these proteins you're talking about, Johan? And perhaps you could uh, explain just what albumin is and what it's signaling. Uh, yeah. yeah, so so albumin is produced in the liver, is a negative acute phase protein. Uh, is You typically will see albumin around um, 34, 36 grams per liter concentration, you know, around um, in the animal, but around parturition, there is a decline in albumin concentration. So that means that the liver has to use all its resources to uh, perhaps synthesize or um, use energy in the form of ATP to um, deal with something else. In this case, oxidation of fatty acids or sterification of fatty acids um, in the liver. So. That's why it's important, these uh, Q-phase proteins, because it helps us to understand what's going on at the liver level and uh, the whole animal level as well. So did I understand right that higher is better for albumin or did I get that the wrong way around? Well, I would say consistent is better, not, not higher, not low. If it's an albumin at the same level through the transition period is a good indication of, of a smooth transition for that cow. Whereas uh, decline in albumin, as we observe with some of those control cows in those experiments that were run at Illinois, they just decline right after calving, um, which which makes sense in the overall, this overall aspect of acute phase protein and inflammation. 
So, well, thanks for that explanation. Uh, just to make sure also, um, because the uh, the VLDL story seems quite complicated. If I understood, methionine plays two roles. One is in terms of as a, as a building block for protein in apolipoprotein synthesis, which is the core protein within the, uh, the complex, but also through eventually being able to provide choline or phosphodiidylcholine, it, it, it also uh, uh, contributes to the structural component. Is that essentially what is happening there or the role of methionine in that situation? Yeah, so if we're looking at the methionine cycle, uh, for instance, you will see that at some point there is uh, methionine serve as a precursor for s adenosyl methionine. And there is another compound that is quite uh, understood, but is 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 well known to be um, uh, one of the biggest methyl donors in the body. So one of those aspects that needs a methyl compound is the production of uh, phosphatidylcholine. So Within the liver, we have observed um, uh, in the, the protein level and also at the gene expression level that there is an influence when you're feeding cows uh, a rumen protected methionine to have an increase towards the synthesis of phosphatidylcholine. Um, that is, like you said, is an essential compound or the element to encapsulate all those triglycerides and cholesterol uh, in the liver, and so they can be exported out of the liver. I see one other uh, molecule we haven't met. I don't think you mentioned yet is NIFAS. You know, so I think, and I think many years ago we used to think NIFAS were bad in the sense that they were high, if they were elevated in animals, that was bad. I think it's not quite so simple the story nowadays. Maybe you'd like to uh, say a word on on NIFAS and how they how are they now used as indicators depending on the physiological stage of the animal. Right. So NIFA has been have a had had a bad rep, <laughs> you know, in terms of transition cows uh, for quite a while. I mean, it's um, it is pretty obvious. I mean, to if you're looking at uh, high levels of NIFA, they're the classical um, uh, response to a high lipid mobilization it will tell you that there is there is a good chance for that cow that have an issue in terms of uh, ketosis, for instance, or fatty liver later on or in a few days after calving. So, um, but on the other hand, uh, um, I mean, what does the liver or the or the mammary gland does with those high NIFA levels? That's a different story. Um, the cows can have the ability to sustain a great amount of, of lipid mobilization as long as, as we have seen that the liver function is not compromised. Uh, because uh, in some instances, if there is more uh, lipid mobilization, you may have more oxidative stress that can be conducive to um, a less response to a resolution of inflammation. So, so if you have an inflammation period, you you want to have a resolution uh, for that inflammation. But in some instances, oxidative stress is like an underlying factor to remain um, to not allow the system to come back to a lower or a pre-inflammatory conditions um, pre-calving. Let's say. Yeah, I mean. Um... I remember from your earlier work, but also since then, that you know, I think in uh, maybe two simple terms, we think that methionine is actually helping to the cow to manage her situation in terms of mobilization. It doesn't seem to particularly change the rate of mobilization when it's uh, when methionine is in the diet or increased amounts are, but it manages. She manages to um, put herself in a bit a better situation to continue to perform well and be healthy at the same time. Um, what Types of mechanisms do you think uh, methionine is playing it, playing to do that? Well, um, yeah, the the lipid mobilization was is typically not affected. I mean, the, these cows mobilize at the same rate. But one important and consistent effect that we have seen is the increase in dry matter intake. So the cows eat more, um, sometimes even prepartum. Um, I tend to think there is several um, mechanisms that we can use to explain this. For instance, one is the, 
the lower inflammatory condition that we have seen is uh, fairly consistent across those trials that we observe. So based again on these acute phase proteins, uh, we're, we can we can infer or is a good indication that there was a lower inflammation. So that's um, a good indication why the cows might eat more. Uh, inflammation is negative correlated with uh, intake, uh, especially some of those key um, cytokines, for instance, the TNF alpha, uh, IL-1 beta that are fairly common to a, uh, exert a decrease in, 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 in intake in, in cows and even in other models like rodents as well. So that's one point. The other one is, and has not been quite explored in, later on, is the uh, uh, neurotransmitters like a nanopeptide Y. Uh, they, there was a connection at a time when I was looking at all this data. There was a slightly connection between methionine supplementation or um, and neuropectal Y, for instance. Um, but there is some research on that in, in rodents. The other thing that I, I don't know, and this is something that I've been thinking more in the past few years is that if you recall uh, Mike Allen's hepatic oxidative theory, that is when there's a lot of uh, lipid mobilization that gets those fatty acids into the mitochondria and you have this um, oxidation to the point of increased acetylcholine accumulation in the liver. And then the cows start eating in a higher rate, like slog feeding uh, really fast after feeding those cows in the pen, the, um, the overall intake is decreased. So I don't know to what extent there is a connection between amino acids in the liver and this effect of um, hypophagia with through the hepatic oxidative theory. So I think that there's there's something there. Uh, we have been looking at um, uh, uh, in liver cells from rodents lately with a student from Italy, um, looking at what will happen when you have uh, a high fatty acids in the media, and then you you put more LPS or like a, a response to inflammation, how does the, how is the transcription of albumin or uh, haptoglobin or the production of these acute phase proteins will look like under those conditions to so try to bridge the gap between metabolism and inflammation that we talked about earlier. Sounds like um, there's still many um, details to work out, but one thing I think you're quite convinced um, uh, that, you know, the, uh, it's important that methionine is already present in increased quantities before parturition. You know, and I often get asked that question, do you really, th how important is it? I mean, uh, what's your um, what's your feeling? How important is the prepartum phase with methionine uh, to set the cow up well for the postpartum phase? Yeah, I think that's that has been one of the very interesting effects that we have seen or phenomena that we have seen in these uh, trials is that um, when you feed rumen protected methionine, there's a consistent effect on the accumulation of liver glutathione on most of these experiments. And I can show you the slide that I show here um, where glutathione has a consistent increase. These are methionine fed cows prepartum across those three experiments in Illinois. So what it tells me is that the liver on a pregnant non-lactating cow might have a, an effect or a way to accumulate glutathione in the liver, which is a potent antioxidant that later on when the cow is start accumulating fatty acids in the liver and perhaps increasing the oxidative stress, the liver already has a preloaded amount of glutathione that can face a surge in um, uh, reactive oxygen species. They are the ones that cause the oxidative stress on transition cows. So I think that there is there is a lot of um, to this story as well uh, in terms of glutathione. Um, glutathione, as you know, uh, is comprised for three. Uh, amino acid, one of the cysteine, that is one of the routes 
how glutathione is being utilized or methionine is being utilized as a precursor for glutathione. And there are some studies uh, from Illinois as well that they observed that at least in part for cysteine um, to be absorbed by the mammary gland was easier as a compound or it was more bioavailable for the mammary gland in the form of glutathione than cysteine itself. At least perhaps some of the tr those transporters, you know, for amino acids in the mammary gland, they always get more than one amino acid uh, and it might be some uh, com competence or um, competition for those for more than one amino acid in those terms. So that's an interesting effect. I mean, uh, we're going to be looking at more on this uh, in the future. Uh, perhaps there is uh, a way to to have a, a, a diet that, you know, let's say uh, energy level or or any other aspect in the diet that can have an interaction with, with methionine in the diet to further optimize the level of glutathione in the liver before the cow uh, calves. So the point of this is that if the cow likely is going to stop eating or, or eat less soon after calving, the good thing of having glutathione already in the liver is, is already there. The cow has it. And even if the decreasing intake might affect the amount of methionine and other amino acids, it's already there. And it can be a supply of amino acids. And even some rodent studies, they call it um, a, a bank of amino acids in the body for for, for, for the animal. Another part of all the story I often get asked uh, my opinion on is um, because here we're showing methionine can really help uh, alleviate or mitigate at least um, a lot of the uh, potential metabolic problems. And, you know, and there has been a school of thought of how can we slow down mobilization so the animal is in less negative balance and less challenge. I find that maybe that might not be the way to go now. It's more, how do you help the cow who's been now genetically programmed just to manage uh, correctly what she's doing? I don't know if you have a, a thought one way or the other on either of these two hypotheses. One, just manage the cow, what she, what she wants to do, or try and make her go back and not mobilize so much that uh, maybe uh, that's more difficult for her to do at this stage of her genetic programming. Yeah, so I think that with the genetic programming, perhaps, you know, high merit cows would tend to just mobilize as much as possible right away. Um, and then if on the top of that, you don't keep track of um, the body condition score of your cows during the dry period, that can just be a recipe for a very complicated <laughs> transition for those cows. So that's one, one of the things you might, you have to pay attention. Uh, the other one is not so much as how how fat the cows are, but actually how much they tend to uh, mobilize. Uh, that's one of the uh, other theories that is not just a cow being 3.5, 3.75, but is how much decrease in body condition score and how quickly the cow can can lose body condition score during the first few weeks. And that can just compromise the whole liver function. Um, I think that, you know, we're, we're learning, learning more and more about this. And, uh, for instance, uh, there is a, some data now indicating that, uh, ketosis, if it's a subclinical ketosis is not actually such a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's not ideal if the cow stop or quit having a low intake, but, um, to some extent, if we go back to that hepatic oxidative, oxidative theory, um, production of ketone bodies is like a safety valve for the liver to release that accumulation of acetylcholine compounds in the liver that later on may have a detrimental effect on the pressing intake right after um, the cows start eating. So all in all, I think there, there is... Um, there's still ways for us to go on this and to learn more about um, how to combine the nutrition and also the management of those cows. Yeah, and I, uh, you mentioned ketosis and subclinical ketosis there, although it wasn't necessarily the um, 
the objectives of the trials you carried out because really you didn't have enough cows. But actually, you, I think you found, if I remember correctly, that um, you had trouble getting control cows on treatment uh, because um, the ones that had no methionine, they tended at calving to have a problem such that you weren't, al you weren't allowed because of your health protocols at the university to keep them on trial. And it took you nearly twice as long or double the amount of cows to get a minimum number of controlled cows on uh, on the treatments at that time. So, um, yeah, it did show, I think, and maybe you like comment a little bit more about, you know, that, um, you know, the, uh, you, you could really see um, the impact of the methionine in uh, alleviating the uh, challenges when a cow calves down. You know, so. Right. So, yeah, that was a very, I mean, anecdotal <laughs> a situation for us. But um, yeah, it was true. It was a little more difficult for us to um, to keep those cows. I think that, you know, like we said, they they have the same uh, per same lipid mobilization. It was just a matter of how the liver was handling this amount of fatty liver or fatty acids reaching, you know, uh, the liver. So I think that um, that's one of the, the, the reasons why, um, you know, high NIFAS, it can happen. The cows can't handle the, depending on the, um, the genetic makeup of, of the cows, but also you can help them out in, in terms of providing these limiting uh, nutrients, especially during the transition period. And I think that, um, for instance, the, I think the, one of the, another reason why um, we are, we're, we're interested on in those amino acids and what they do is if, if there is uh, some uh, enzyme that is limited based on amino acids like methionine that can help out cows to either um, reduce ketosis or oxidize more fatty acids or export those fatty acids at DLDL um, and kind of, you know, um, counterbalance any effects with, uh, with uh, glutathione. So um, I, just um, going back to your first trial, um, because in fact, one of the interesting things in that trial, you know, was that, you know, I would say has two sources of methionine, which, um, play the same role, but from a molecular point of view are quite different. You know, one is a protected source of DL methionine. The other one is basically a protected source of the analog of methionine. Was there re any essential difference in results, uh, uh, whether the, um, it was an analog source or a DL methionine source of methionine that was being protected and supplied to the animal? Yeah. So the, the fact that the analog is rapidly absorbed by the rumen wall and also the, the other portion of the analog can be utilized by, um, um, rumen microbes can improve the, um, that production of not only of microbial protein, but also, um, uh, some of the BFAs that can improve the, um, uh, milk fat synthesis. And that's something that we observe in that trial when we compare the smart mean and the, also the meta smart. Um, I think that on the smart mean side, there is also um, some effect that um, we're still not not um, quite clear as we we have um, we have help with some experiments done in with some colleagues in, in in Brazil that they observe some effect between smartamine and also milk fat as well. So in that sense, I think there is there might be a connection between what the release of methionine in the lower gut might be affecting some sort of absorption of fatty acids um, in into the enteral sites. So there is an interesting effect, but at least in our trial, we observe uh, a difference in in, in uh, milk fat um, uh, production, and there was a quite a here and there a few transient um, differences on the on the some of those metabolites related to um, fatty acid oxidation in the liver as well. Yeah, but I never remember rightly. Yes, there was some transient, but. Uh, 
and one of the I think you decided in your published uh, paper for the most part to regroup you know the uh, the two sources of methane together because they were similar because that gave you more power in the comparison against control to show that there was a true metabolizable methane effect uh, for for the most part it, it, is that correct yeah so i think that because um we observe a similar effect in terms of milk milk production and also uh, milk protein um and we also wanted to look at compare the overall effect of methionine, rumen protected methionine, and we kind of combine and make put it together between the control and those two methionine sources. I think you have a you know a, a last slide, uh, one of your slides where you look at you know just the, uh, to give people you know the we can talk a lot about uh, this subject, but just to show you. If you don't put yourself in a good situation, what you can lose in terms of of performance, never mind what I call the health the health issues. But um, so maybe you just like to comment on uh, what this slide shows and the severity of uh, the impact of let's say poor poor transition cow uh, management and health. Right. So I I have I mean. We have put together this slide with the other colleagues in Illinois that um, um, it is because we all often talk about health, inflammation, you know, acute phase proteins, but what does that, what does it mean in terms of the actual production of the animals? That's why uh, we put together this, this slide. And what you're looking at here is um, about a hundred transition cows and they were separated based on their level of um, triglycerides in the liver. So you can see that cows in a mild and a, to a moderate um, um, triglycerides in the liver, they can perform as well. So cows between five and 10, they can sustain a lactation really well. So that's the whole point of, you know, we've got to be a little more careful on one we call a subclinical case or how much of that can affect, really affect the, the, the performance of the animal. However, once we start looking at above 10% of triglycerides, that's when things just kind of fall apart for the cow, where it starts seeing about a reduction of five kilograms or about 10 pounds in the, in the milk production for those animals between the mild and the severe uh, fatty liver in, in those transition cows. So, um, if you put that in context, you know, there is a lot on the background that is happening between those those groups in terms of inflammation, oxidative stress, acute phase protein. So that's what we look at. We're looking at those markers to tell us the complete or a, a more rounded story of, about what's going on of the cows in terms of health and how that can affect the milk production. And there I seem to remember um... I think it was one with one of your um, associates in uh, Italy that you've looked at other um, uh, biomarkers for want of a better expression because that could also contribute to, you know, predict upfront cows who are potentially at risk. Um, would you like to say a little bit on that? So biomarkers for for um, health, transition cow health. Yeah, yeah, like yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there, one of those uh, that we observed was uh, ceruloplasmin. This um, this uh, um, positive acute phase protein that is related to um, red blood cells and iron um, utilization in the blood. Um, so the higher this concentration of this marker, the more inflammation um, and the the cow is undergoing. So on Based on this marker, we observe a lower ceruloplasmin in cows that were supplemented with methionine. There was a zero mamiloid A as well. There's another uh, positive acute phase protein that we observe a lower concentration of that marker in methionine supplemented cows. So I think that that's why it was hard to separate the effects of smartamine and merasmar because they were uh, pretty similar in terms of metabolism and inflammation. Well, time uh, time goes quickly, and uh, so. Um, uh, but before I 
let you go. I'd just like to um, have your, you know, your um, guidelines on, you know, um, maybe what should be some target methionine levels, you know, that we should be uh, thinking about for uh, optimum health and performance of dairy cows, both prepartum and immediately postpartum. Yeah, so I think that that depends on the, the objective is different, right? The prepartum will be something is always had been more of a maintenance kind of um, uh, type of formulation. And now we're trying to we're understand more that there is an important component for providing adequate nutrients, not just for the cow, but also for the calf. Um, so in those terms, I, I think that um, providing a, a higher level of methionine, um, say, uh, around 2.3, 2.5% of metabolizable protein, if possible, uh, that can bring down the, the ratio between lysomethionine between 2.7, 2.8. Um, that's a good uh, target. Then the, the difference, obviously, when you, when you start um, uh, formulating diets for lactating cows is about the production of milk, milk synthesis. So even in some instances, you also have to provide lysine because lysine becomes a little more restricted. And um, that's one of the things that we had to do in one of the more recent experiments that, that we did at South Dakota that we have to actually did, we had to supplement um, rumen protect the lysine and methionine to kind of increase both uh, levels. So we have a good um, level of both, but also a good ratio between lysine and methionine. And those are some of the uh, common things that we're looking at now, uh, trying to decrease rumen on the rail protein by increasing the levels of lysine and methionine and trying to come up with cheaper diets. Um, it's particularly important nowadays, you know, with all this COVID, you know, that there are some closing of the uh, meat plants. So there is less blood meal supplies or there is less of some of those um, commodities that help us to put a good RUP in the diet of the cow. So this is a good alternative, you know, for, for dairy farmers. Well, thank you so much, Johan. It's always good um, talking to you on this subject. It never gets old. So uh, <laughs> even for someone like me, and um, you always yeah. uh, bring something very interesting uh, to the table. So can't thank you enough, and hopefully uh, we will have the chance to talk on this or some other topic in the very near future. And I wish you every success in your new position at Virginia Tech. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. This concludes today's Ruminant Science Conversation brought to you by Adiseo.